Hi, everyone. This is Ali Hassan. I wanted to let you know that for the next few weeks, we are going to be re-airing some of our favorite episodes from our Doctor vs. Comedian library. I hope you enjoy them. Today in a special episode, we will be interviewing ophthalmologist Dr. Will Flannery, better known as comedian and social media sensation Dr. Glaucom Flecken. This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, what we normally do is I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment and question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic for medicine and health and grills me on that topic. However, this is a special episode. Pew, 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 pew. Special episode alert. Today, our guest is ophthalmologist Dr. Will Flannery, better known as comedian Dr. Glaucom Flecken. I want you to head down to radiology and look at the CT scan with the radiologist. Oh, okay. Hello? Is anybody here? Can I help you? Oh, you scared me. <laughs> I didn't see you there. I know. There are many places to hide down here. In the dark. Right. I was hoping you could look at a CT scan with me. What's that? A CT scan? No. That thing around your neck. Uh, stethoscope? What does it image? Uh, nothing. You listen through it. Hmm. Primitive. So, that CT scan? The computed tomography scan can wait. Okay. How about a good morning first? Is it still morning? I don't know. We don't have any windows. That is a clip of our guest, social media sensation, Dr. Glaucom Flecken, also known as Will Flannery. Welcome to Dr. vs. Comedian. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get started, I think there's one burning question we just want to get off the bat right at the beginning. What is a Glaucom Flecken? Yeah, yeah, good question. I also have missed that, that day of med school, <laughs> I guess. Well, first of all, you, you did a great job saying Glaucom Flecken. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, a lot of people can't do that. It's really not as exciting as it sounds. It has to do with angle closure glaucoma, where parts of your lens inside your eye, the cells die and they clump up and form these little white dots called glaucom flag. Isn't it exciting? Aren't you so glad you asked? The reason I chose it was just because it's the most ridiculous word I could think of in ophthalmology, and I knew I wanted to have a kind of a comedy, medical comedy type thing going on. And that yells comedy, all of that, all of that description. Absolutely, of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> glaucoma. Who, who doesn't find angle closure glaucoma <laughs> funny and exciting? Well, we do, oddly, <laughs> I guess, or at least the persona that you created. And we have a lot of people in the medical field who are fans of this show and who are subscribers of this show. But for those who may not have had the pleasure of listening to you, because I think most people in the medical world, it's fair to say, will know you, will know your social media personality. Can you give us a sort of a day-to-day? -day? What is your non-comedic life and what is your comedic life? How do you divide these? Well, I spend most of the day avoiding responding to emails. Like, honestly, that's, that's a big part of it. But as far as what I do and my day job, my ophthalmology job, I get to work at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I am in clinic or I'm in the operating room all day. By all day, you know, this is an ophthalmologist schedule. So keep that in mind. And so I get a little nice little hour lunch break. I'm home by around five o'clock. It's really, it's a wonderful thing. And then whenever I'm not, you know, operating or in clinic, I'll occasionally spend some time with my family. That's, <laughs> um, they, they enjoy that. That sounds like an afterthought. But From time to time. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the comedy stuff, the TikToks, the Twitter, I'll do that not the TikToks, but, you know, tweeting and things like that. I'll do that a little bit during the day if I have time. The TikToks take a little bit more planning, but I, I don't usually write anything down. You know, I just kind of, you know, over the course of a week or so, I'll be thinking of ideas or I'll read something that I thought was kind of funny or something interesting that someone said. 
to help out with this, I follow a lot of different people on social media from a lot of different specialties. Right. Because remember, I am an ophthalmologist, right? So I don't do body medicine. I <laughs> It it's been stops a long above time the nose, since right? I've even it stops like, above the nose, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. so I don't know a lot of things about medicine, but it helps me to hear what other people are talking about. And so I'll just kind of over the course of a few days or so, I'll just kind of formulate things and come up with a couple of jokes and then I'll record the videos. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So you're not a big script out every line or something like that. Is it a bit more like I have the ideas for these jokes and then you just kind of is a bit more improv? Yeah, whenever I'm recording the videos, uh, basically I'll think of a like a primary joke, mm -hmm. like something that I know mm -hmm. is is really good, and then I'll I'll build around that. But I, I I don't really script it out because I have the time whenever I'm recording to just stop and think, and and so you know I'm not a so much of a planner, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. to speak. It was different whenever I you know I have a bit of a stand up mm -hmm. background, probably not as much as Ali, but. Uh, Whenever I do stand up, or more recently, whenever I speak to audience, because I do a lot of speaking as well, kind of medical comedy mix of speaking, I'll plan that out a little bit more. But uh, when I'm doing the social media stuff, it's kind of fly by the seat of my pants kind of thing. Is it because you can kind of craft things in the editing process because of that? You have that ability, yeah. whereas obviously in front of people. Then let's go back a sec then. Maybe just talk about how you started off in comedy itself. And was that through stand-up? Yeah. So a friend of mine from high school, one of my good friends was doing stand-up, started doing stand-up in Houston. So there's a couple of big comedy clubs in Houston. And he was doing it and, and I thought it was fun. I'd always kind of enjoyed making people laugh. What year was that, by the way, Will, just to give us a later Yeah, of the this, was, this would be in about 2000. Okay. Yeah. So wait, no, no, I would have, I would have been way too young there. It was 2003. So I was like, but you were a young guy. You I were was, oh, under junior, 20. senior in, oh, in, wow. in high school. I couldn't, yeah. uh, I couldn't stay past a certain time at a, at a couple of the comedy <laughs> clubs because yeah. I wasn't 21. And so it was, I was somewhat limited in what I could do, but yeah, I just remember watching a lot of comedians and kind of you know, helping me to you know, shape what I was doing on stage. That's kind of when I got started. Who were some of your influences, like comedic? Who do you think mm -hmm. when you're thinking about comedy, who are the, the main people? Who you're like, these are my influences. Well, I grew up watching Letterman. Yeah. Like my parents watched it every night, watched him every night. And so that's that's the earliest I remember seeing it. So a lot of my comedy, you know, that deadpan kind of delivery mm -hmm. that's and you can see that in a lot of my videos. It's really kind of a lot of dry humor. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing, having an inspiration, like, you know, older people, it'll be Carson, and then you see Letterman and a lot of these late night hosts. And what happens is if Letterman signs off on somebody, has a comedian on, then you just sort of naturally like that comedian because you're like, well, if Letterman yeah, wanted to have right. them on the show, then I, <laughs> you know, if Letterman likes mm -hmm. them, then I should probably like them because I like Letterman. So then you just, it's an interesting place to start and then just right? grow, grow, grow your mind. To, I mean, that's to, an easy way to get exposure to different comedians, right? Absolutely. And, and mm -hmm. same thing with Conan. You know, I had a lot of friends and I watched a little bit of Conan. And so those two guys really were, were big and how I approached comedy. Yeah. Yeah. You started in Houston, right? You had a friend in mm -hmm. Houston. He encouraged yep. you to come out. It was a encouraging, supportive uh, community? As much as it could be, I guess. I would say it wasn't not encouraging. <laughs> I'm pretty introverted by nature. So it, it actually took a lot for me to mm -hmm. kind of get out there and get started. But once I was finally able to get up the courage to go out there and perform, I was pretty much sold on, on at least wanting to make people laugh, wanting to do comedy in some respect. I do like you mentioning that you're introverted because I think a lot of people worry about themselves as introverts, their mm -hmm. children's as introverts. Introvert, Dr. Will here, <laughs> tens of thousands <laughs> of followers on the web, right. deals with human beings every day in his clinic, speaks to people in large gatherings, and has done a fair amount of stand-up comedy and might do it again. So uh, introverts, you know, we can, we can get places. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's just like, it just means that I... Like every now and then I got to just get away from people, right? Like I'm okay. I can be around people. Mm -hmm. I can talk and make jokes in front of people. But sometimes I just have to not do that and, and just get away and be by myself for a while. Turn it off. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Now, I wanted to ask you one more question about stand up. How long did you do that for? And, you know, it's interesting making that transition because I will tell people, the listeners who may not know this, there has been classically this divide 
And, you know, I'll say I was guilty of it, too. And Bo Burnham sort of had shifted my mind on this. But there's this divide where purists in stand up comedy don't think that anything else is really comedy. Now, over the last seven to 10 years, a lot of people have had to come to a sort of a you come to terms with that whole thing. And I think Bo Burnham said it best because a lot of people were like, oh, you don't understand. You've never been heckled on a Friday late show. Friday late show being when most of the drunks are out <laughs> and you have absolutely no appreciation for your craft. Mm -hmm. And you question all your life decisions as a stand up comedian. But Bo Burnham said, I was 15 years old getting 30,000 different hate mails a week. So I think yeah. I paid my dues. I think YouTube, I paid my YouTube dues. comments. I think yeah, is what yeah. he said. YouTube, like yeah. ten thousand YouTube comments, which just can absolutely wreck your mental health, right? And yeah, and with Bo Burnham especially, that's that's a big thing that he's talked about. Right. So I wanted to ask you about that. How do you make that adjustment from loving that in person, that buzz, mm -hmm. that buzz, that high you get off of stand up, and transitioning to this thing that's more sort of insular. And also, how do you translate the feedback, good and bad, in a club to the good and bad that comes online? So, first of all, in the deciding between comedy and medicine, and you know how I kind of combine those two, I would say I never seriously considered pursuing comedy as a career. And part of that's just I was in a very science-oriented family, mm -hmm. and uh, I just I was exposed to science early on, and I just I loved it. And so I since like middle school, I wanted to be a doctor. Oh, wow. Yeah. But comedy. So I always kind of viewed comedy as a hobby. I, I decided at some point, I think it was probably in college is when I decided I would say I never thought about comedy as a career, but I decided to go the much easier route of becoming a doctor. You heard it from Dr. Will Flannery's <laughs> mouth, people. Comedy you. is harder than oh, medicine. Oh, Give absolutely. me the respect I deserve, people. <laughs> it's, that is a tough way to make a living. It's really hard. From just talking with my friends who have tried to do it and, and just being exposed, talking to comedians over the years in comedy clubs and transitioning from being like more of a stand up, you know, doing stand up in, in clubs and then going to the social media thing. I do actually think doing comedy on social media, especially starting out doing it is way less supportive, way mm -hmm. less supportive, because when you're in a comedy clubs, you're all I guess if you're in the right situation, it can feel very collaborative. I remember time sitting around a table at midnight with a couple of other amateur comedians and just giving each other ideas and riffing off each other. And it was great. Mm -hmm. And you don't really feel that in social media at very much, especially to start out. Now it's different. People know who I am. I mean, you know all about that. And then whenever you get online, and as, especially when I first started, it was people don't know you there. You're talking to people that are not in the same headspace as you are a lot of time. I think that's where a lot of conflict in social media comes about, right? Is because you're just throwing things out into the world. And whoever happens to see it, no matter if they are nothing like you, if they have no sense of humor whatsoever, they're going to see your stuff and say what they want about it. And so it's hard at first, especially when you first start seeing those comments of people like telling you you're unprofessional and you shouldn't be a doctor. And right. I have learned, uh, you know, I've been doing this now for like five years and I've certainly learned, I don't read every, every reply I get. I don't read every quote tweet or mm, comment. So important. So yeah, important. Not yeah. To. And it's helped for sure. And I, whenever I do see the negative comments, which are less now than they used to be, it's easier for me to just ignore it and chalk it up to someone who I don't really need to be interacting with. Like, what's the point, you know? Maybe I'll just jump ahead because I want to ask you this a bit later, but you just kind of brought this up right now. So I have seen some of your videos, I've seen lots of your videos, and one of the recent series you had was this nephrology versus cardiology. And this is kind of a bit of an inside joke in medicine, but it's funny because we've talked in this podcast before about stereotypes of doctors. We've talked about the hidden curriculum in medicine, you know, which I'm sure you've heard about. And so there are these stereotypes. So I just find this stuff resonates. Why is it that I practice in a different specialty in a different country than you? And I know exactly what you're talking about with the nephrologists and cardiologists having this fight over, are you fluid overloading a patient or not? And what's more important, the heart or the kidneys or the nephrons? And so I guess- Dude, We're all the same, man. We're all the same. <laughs> well, this is it. So the first question is, why do you think your comedy resonates so much with physicians? Well, why do you think that is? I think it's- 
because those stereotypes are all true. It's like there's so much truth in all of those and all those different specialties. They all attract the same types of personalities. And honestly, I didn't go into this thinking everyone's going to relate to this. I really, with all these different specialties, I just drew on a lot of it was just my own experiences interacting with those types of doctors. And then it just so happens that everybody experienced the same type of thing. I also, I think what really relates to people is the interpersonal conflict between specialties. And that's really what I focus mm -hmm. on because medicine can be really tricky to do humor in. Number one, it's just not very common. All the people do it. Number two, doctors take themselves way too seriously, mm -hmm. like very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to do this in a way that Number one, doesn't make people mad at me. And number two, it gets people to engage because doctors like pointing out the conflict between different specialties as opposed to like conflicts between doctors and patients. I don't go there. I don't do that. I don't think mm -hmm. that's funny, mm -hmm. first of all. And that's that's where you're going to get into a lot of trouble if you're trying to start making fun of patients and mm -hmm. patient interactions and stuff. And there are people that do that on social media and it's cringeworthy. It's pretty awful. I hate that kind of stuff. But it's the cardiologists and nephrologists going back and forth mm -hmm. on these things that on the surface, you know, to the average person, be like, this, why are they fighting like this? This is so silly. But that's part <laughs> yeah. of why it's, I think it's funny to people. Well, you mentioned, Will, this cringeworthy element mm -hmm. of medical humor, medical related humor. I wanted to sort of dive into your philosophy in comedy. I wanted to ask you what that is. And I, I don't know if it's related to that specifically. But I did want to ask, what is your approach when you do comedy? Do you have some sort of a mantra or some sort of guiding principles? Yeah, I do. It's nothing new. It's the whole, you know, punching up, not down kind of thing. But it's, it's especially important in medicine because medicine is full of power dynamics. It's like everything's a power dynamic. There's interns, residents, attendings, patients, nurses. Mm -hmm. It's like everyone feels like they're in a hierarchy in some respect. So let me give you an example. So... Whenever you're in med school, pretty much every class will do like a skit, like a med student skit where they just lambast their attendings. They just make fun of their attendings. Right. And it's funny. People love it. Well, it would be horrifying if attendings did the same thing to med students. If the attendings made fun of the med students, it would, right, be, exactly. it would be awful. And so that's just a perfect example of obeying those power dynamics. And so I really take mm -hmm. that to heart whenever I'm doing this. And I've made mistakes. I mean, I've... I've pissed people off. I have in the past made fun of not specific patients, but made fun of patients in a way. And, and it just never works. It never works. And it just ends up making people feel bad, making you feel bad about yourself or what's perceived as picking on a vulnerable group of people. Mm -hmm. And so that's my biggest guiding principle is punching up. That's why it's mostly attending to attending conflicts I'm making fun of or it's the med student, resident attending, or a resident fellow interacting with an attending who has clear personality disorder and is the butt of the joke. And so that's that's where mm -hmm. I approach it. And it's been a trial and error thing. Like the way I approach it is just because I've made mistakes and not doing it and doing it a different way that didn't work. Although med students, I should mention this, making fun of attendings, that would be punching up in a way. Would it not be, right? That's the one time that... Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. the one time you punch oh, yeah. up. yeah. That's great. Because med students have no, they don't have any power right. in that relationship, right? And so much of what humor is just at its basic level is you're faced with this insurmountable obstacle, this situation where you have no power. And using comedy, using humor, whether it's a defense mechanism or just you're just telling jokes, it's to gain some semblance of control over the situation mm -hmm. that's uncontrollable, yeah. that you have no control over. And so you're using comedy to try yeah. to, to attain that. We were watching, uh, Asif and I were both shared it with each other, this video of you in June, you made these comments on somebody else's video. They were more making fun of patients, particularly patients who come in and say, my pain is 10 on 10, but they seem very lackadaisical about their 10 on 10 pain. And you made a comment, which I felt was very, like it was the most positive feedback in a critique. You said, look, this is what I try not to do. Because now you're making fun of the patient rather than making fun of the pain scale itself. 
And I thought that was very interesting. I guess the only saving grace of that particular video was that it was an actor doing it, right? Because to see a person in the medical field, to see a doctor doing that and yeah. have patients be like, oh, is this what our doctors think of us when we go in there? It's, you know, it's, it's really the last thing somebody needs. Well, it's even worse, actually, because that person portrays themselves as a doctor. Right. And if you go through the, the comments on TikTok, people assume he, he's a doctor. Oh, yeah, okay. it's 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 pretty because the guy is a, a former ER tech or something. And so he worked in an emergency room at some point and now is no longer doing that. But that's where he got all of his followers from is doing these medical videos. And so he keeps it up. But that's a big problem because he portrays himself as a doctor. But your point is absolutely right on. No matter who it is, but if, especially if it's an actual doctor doing that kind of comedy, it just looks bad. It's not right because mm -hmm. the patients are in such a vulnerable position whenever they come to see their doctor. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, as any kind of, any person who sees patients or takes care of patients, you can't violate that trust. People, the general public, I mean, look at all the anti-vax people and everybody that doesn't want to get a vaccine. A lot of the comments you see are just people who don't trust the medical profession. They don't trust doctors right, and right. stuff like that. Videos like that. Oh, it just makes it so much worse. Mm -hmm. Like there's way, and my point in that thread was that there's ways to approach these irritating things that we have to deal with in medicine, like having to ask patient on a scale of one to 10, what their pain is and not knowing what kind of answer you're going to get. There's ways of attacking these ideas that doesn't put the brunt of the humor on patients and, you know, be perceived as making fun of them. I was going to actually ask you sort of similarly in terms of, I'm just thinking about this, if you've got any pushback from physicians or non-physicians, even though you adhere to this, and I, and I would say your money is where your mouth is, because I've seen so many of your videos, and I, I think you do do this in terms of punching up, but the Emerge doctor is always wearing their bike shorts and bike helmet, which is, again, I told Ali this a couple episodes ago, my friend who's an Emerge doc does that hella skiing where they you know, helicopter into these remote places. But did you ever get pushback in terms of, like I said, either from patients or from other physicians? Like, I don't know. No, not, you know, I used to. Again, I think it's all about people's expectations. I feel like I'm well enough known in the medical community that people understand when they see my face in a video, like, oh, this is going to be humor. This is going to be comedy. And mm -hmm. when I first got mm -hmm. started and I was just telling jokes on Twitter, a lot of it's going over people's heads because I was new. No one knew who this guy with this cartoon ophthalmoscope avatar was. And, mm -hmm. and so it's expectations. <laughs> well, and I think also to that, Will, is you have a stand-up comedy origin story and you remember the value of an open mic, right? Testing and failing. Yeah. And it's important to fail. One of the most important things in stand-up comedy is failure and you fail in a room of 20 to 50 people and you go, let me, let me see. The problem with the internet, of course, is now you fail in front of potentially thousands <laughs> or more. And so I, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for that. I have a lot of respect for like you sort of figuring out your, your gear, you know, your lane, you're like, okay, shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And with every tweet and every early video, you're effectively doing an open mic and finding it. And now you say, like, I've done this for a long time and I've learned. Fortunately, social media has a very short memory. <laughs> oh, yeah. On to the next thing real quick. Right. So yeah. people will for... <laughs> but this also goes to, I have also transitioned more to doing, I've done a lot of, of speaking. I mean, not during, it's all been Zoom during COVID and everything, but I do get invited to go and, and do talks at, at conferences. And I've actually learned from that as well, especially in medicine, about managing people's expectations. Because at first, I would go to these conferences where I would like, they would ask, they want me to be funny, they want me to do a comedy, and it'd be like eight o'clock in the morning. And mm. people are still rolling in. And that's the, mm. the, the time they give me and I'm sitting up there doing stand up, people are like not paying attention. And it's awful. And that was like right at the beginning of when I started to try to bring this comedy to medicine in an in-person format. And so I've learned from that as well. Whenever I'm trying to do comedy at conferences, you have to incorporate some education into it as well. Because especially at conferences, because sure. like doctors, we're not normal people. Like it's it's like very strange. And like <laughs> we're always wanting to have, feeling like we have to learn something. And so that's why I started to incorporate more like 
education into the comedy and kind of combining the two and it just works mm-hmm, so much better mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's all because of what they're expecting if people that go to a comedy club they're they're expecting jokes and only jokes conferences a little, right. a little bit different and then when you get back to just doing it on social media it makes it that much harder because everyone's got different expectations of what they're wanting to hear and what they're wanting to see and if if it doesn't align with their values or what they expect People will tell you about it, and mm. that's when you get all the negative right. comments. Well, this comment of yours about expectations really leads me to something I wanted to ask you about. I used to be a chef, and I was starting to open mic and do comedy. So I was a chef and a comedian, but I never wanted those two worlds to collide. You know, I, I was trying to get – I lived in Montreal and Quebec, and there's – In my mind, or at least in the circles I wanted to get into, there was a certain expectation of what the person in your home doing this chef at domicile, it's called in-house chef Mm -hmm. services, who they should be. And I was always worried that people might be like, wait a minute, you're doing comedy? (laughs) We don't want a clown in our kitchen. We want somebody who's a competent, you know? But then I was like, but once I get on the food network or whatever it is, or I get on the comedy network, I'll let them know who I am and then the worlds can collide. Was there ever any concern of that, that yeah. doing comedy would discredit your ophthalmology, you know, the thing you've worked so hard to create, that career? Well, that's why a lot of people, especially in the healthcare field, will have an anonymous social media account, right? Because they're afraid of backlash. Right. They're afraid of, especially when you're in training and you feel like you're at the mercy of your program. Oh, of course. We have a friend who has an anonymous account just because he's Muslim and he eats bacon. And he's like, my family can't find out about it. So you can imagine, yeah, when it's your career and people's lives are at yeah. stake, because of course, mm-hmm. yeah. Once I got into my job out of training and I felt more secure, I felt more comfortable putting my face out there. But a big part of the reason I did that was I, I wanted to kind of more reveal myself. Now it's you can find who I am, my name, every, where I work, all mm-hmm. this, no problem. But part of the reason I wanted to do that was to show that you can do comedy in medicine, that it's two things mm-hmm. that can be joined together because medicine in a lot of ways we have a lot of pr problems patients don't see us as regular people Mm -hmm. and a lot of doctors don't feel like patients should see us as regular people that we should just be on all the time that in terms of having the utmost professionalism and and we can't show our true personalities right that's the wrong way to approach this like uh, patients especially you know i've been a patient a number of times you guys are probably aware of my cardiac arrest from mm-hmm. last year mm-hmm. i know sorry he might be hearing some there's like yard work going on outside my house i sorry. thought it was your pacemaker for a second i was like did he bring up his <laughs> yeah, cardiac no, no. arrest because something is buzzing inside his body <laughs> if i pass out uh, call call somebody oh uh, no it's because patients need to know they want their doctors to be relatable. They want their doctors to, on a certain level, seem just like normal people like them, that they can mm-hmm. have conver- you know, delicate private conversations with and that they can trust this person. And I think using humor, showing your true personality is a way to do that. And so it feels like a relatively new thing trying to combine comedy and medicine, but I want more people to do it. I want that to be a thing. And a huge part of what I do is showing that you can do this professionally. Like you can do this without sacrificing Mm -hmm. your reputation in medicine. It's not hard to do. And so, you know, it's kind of one of my driving motivations. Well, I'll tell you something. I really appreciate you saying that because this whole experience of us doing this podcast, I've had that trepidation. And it's nice to hear from someone who is extremely successful. I said to Ali, everybody in medicine knows who you are. Like I tell them, oh, by the way, you know, we're interviewing Dr. Gladwell Fleckett. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> everyone knows who you are. And so, but to hear that message yeah. for me, I'll just be like, just me personally, it really makes a difference to me because it's something I worry about every day on the podcast. I'm like, Ali, maybe don't swear on the podcast. Uh, maybe don't talk about drinking. He's like, what? why would we not talk about drinking? Like what? Doctors drink. Doctors use profanity. Doctors tell jokes. Like, we're just normal people. Exactly. You know? So I, I do appreciate that. Never mind how much I appreciate that. He had to hear that from somebody else. Will, I'm glad it's you. Uh, <laughs> le- months from now, I'll be, remember what Will been said. Working on remember what Dr. Right. Flannery that's, that's right. said. Right. Come on. Right. You can talk about tequila. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. So maybe just in the last few minutes, Ali, you had some questions. I did have some questions. related questions. Some I related questions. Oh. So, all right, here we go. Number one question was, 
in basically 2020, 2021, do you see a different set of issues with eyes than you did, let's say, 10 years ago in 20, 2010? Hmm. Yeah, a lot more. Um, everyone's on screens all the time, right? And so a lot of eye strain issues, people that need to be in reading glasses that are not using them because they're constantly looking at a screen, they're getting headaches, dry eyes, lots of stuff that comes with screen time. So I, I, I'm like constantly talking about this. But there's a lot of stuff that just never goes away, mm -hmm. like people mis misusing contacts and getting infections and from that stuff. But the screen time thing with the pandemic. Yeah. Everyone, we're all on screen. I mean, it's just going to get worse and worse over time. But Will, do you have any horror stories about contacts? Because I don't think Ali knows. Ooh. Ali wears contacts, right? You wear contacts it's been a while. sometimes. It's been yeah. a while. Now that I have like, uh, you know, I need the, yeah. the reading but Most thing. ophthalmologists wear glasses. All the ones I know, they don't like yeah. contacts. So I don't know if you have any. Uh... Yeah, you know, I've seen some. I mean, I've seen people lose eyes oh, from God. contact oh, lens related infections. So is is like, and they're they're gross. Oh, man. There's a lot in ophthalmology that's just kind of, that's one of the things that you have to ask yourself if you want to be an ophthalmologist. Are eyeballs gross to you? If you can tolerate the idea of discharge coming from somebody's eye, then maybe you can be an ophthalmologist. But whenever you have an infection, it's pretty bad. People like washing their contacts with uh, tap water or not clean, not taking them out at night. Mm -hmm. There was this on the, the Olympics. There was a video that anytime anything happens on social media related to eyes, right. you can imagine. They always tag you. I am told thousands of times. And so this, I think it was a wrestler or a judo or something. Uh, the contact fell out. She popped it in her mouth oh, and put it in her eye. That's a surefire way to have a horrible eye infection. And so it's, it's stuff like that. Just, you know. Uh, yeah, I've done that maybe a hundred times in my life. But, uh, <laughs> good to know that I. Uh, Please don't. I, yeah, I, I won't. I'm anymore. glad to hear you're mostly in glasses. Now. I'm mostly That's, in glasses. That makes that yeah. warms my. I even my have prescription profile. sunglasses. It's all glasses. It's a glasses. That's like, great. So on that note, you know these corrective eye surgeries, yay or nay? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, they're great. It's got diminishing returns as you get older. That's right. So, you know, LASIK and PRK, which are two ways of accomplishing the same thing. They're great if you're in your 20s and in your early 30s. Yeah. You know, once you get into your 40s, you pretty much will immediately be in reading glasses after you get LASIK. So that's what I tell people. It's got diminishing returns over time, but they're great procedures. Yeah. The problem is people see that, oh, wait, why does my ophthalmologist wear glasses if he's telling me that I should get LASIK? We just know too much. That's, that's, and that's the problem with every doctor. Mm -hmm. Sure. We see every instance where it doesn't go right, okay? And it's something that it's just always in the back of our mind, even though the procedure's so safe, right? It's like more than 99% of the time, everything's going to go just fine. But it's those like one or two That's bad. It. Yeah. My buddy who's a dermatologist never got his LASIK for that reason. He goes, it's a 0.2% <laughs> chance that something goes wrong. But if it does, I lose my entire career. Everything I worked for, I have to see. I have to see dermatology. It's, yeah, right. Yeah. How do we overall keep our eyes healthy? What's the best advice for keeping our eyes healthy? Well, if you're, if you're a contact lens wearer, don't sleep in them. Take care of your contacts. General rule of thumb with screen time. Screens are fine. Mm -hmm. You're going to be fine. But if you start getting headaches, you know, taking breaks. I feel ridiculous saying this, but like every 20 minutes, you're supposed to take 20 seconds and look 20 feet away. Mm. 20, 20, 20. Every 20 minutes, take 20 seconds and look 20 feet away. Now, that's ridiculous. No one's going to actually like do that, right? But if I can just put it in your mm -hmm. head, like, oh, wait, maybe I should take a break right now. I've been on uh, looking at my phone for four hours on TikTok or whatever. And then don't believe like non-doctors when they tell you things about your eye. Oh, my God. The things that I have heard mm -hmm. over like, people using urine eye drops, oh my God. sun gazing eyeball tattoos it's like it never ends there's always something some crazy thing that someone's doing to their eyes your eyes it's an organ don't tell the cardiologist i said that but it is absolutely <laughs> the eyeball is an organ and you got you don't mess with it it's it's just you only get two of them <laughs> come on people. carrots you haven't mentioned carrots yet where do where do carrots <laughs> carrots and handstand I, I eat a, an entire bag every day you now? and my family is annoyed by it, but I, it's <laughs> no, it's uh, carrots, 
Yeah, eat your carrots. Eat your carrots. Eat your carrots but Ellie. is vitamin A like is that how often do you see a vitamin A deficiency that results in you know not a link very, to a um, vitamin A deficiency is extremely rare with our normal diets. Yeah, you know now. But still, nothing wrong with the carrots, right? I love carrots. Nothing, I love carrots. So I'm in a good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eat the carrots. Yeah, no, it's good news. Please. <laughs> We'll, we'll don't don't be um, on a flight where the only doctor on board is an ophthalmologist. That's uh, they cannot you never, help you. That's always a bad idea. I'll yeah. uh, see what else can I. Uh, I think that's about it. That's all the advice. That's good advice. Right. But will before we go, I did want to bring up uh, First Ascents, which is a charity that you support. If people get a cameo from you, all that money was going towards First Ascents. So do you want to just tell our listeners a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I am a two-time testicular cancer survivor, and I got involved in a group that supports young adults uh, impacted by cancer, which is a group that's often overlooked. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't think about the young adult population, people in the 20s, 30s who have cancer. And so it supports them, allows uh, young adults to find a support network, brings them together for these outdoor adventure programs, and helping them make lifelong friends and people that they can go to to talk to and, and just uh, get support from. Uh, it's a great uh, organization based out of Colorado, and they do th things like kayaking, mountain climbing, surfing. Mm -hmm. And no matter what your level of activity is, you can get involved in this. And it's uh, just a fantastic community. So that's first descent. Yeah, I'll just spell that for people. D-E-S-C-E-N-T-S, -E -E descent, as in the opposite of an ascent. Although, ascent. I don't I mean, yep. you, I'm sure you, you ascend also as you join the group. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, it gives me pause to think that you've had testicular cancer twice and cardiac arrest uh, in your young life. I tell you, my wife, she's sick of it. Yeah. She's like, <laughs> enough already, stop? yeah. Can you please stop? This is this is enough. Does she think it's attention seeking behavior? <laughs> <laughs> we wish you well, man. I mean that from the bottom of our heart. You do such great work. You illuminate not only in your medical work, which I should give more respect to, but of course, just because my own background, okay. I love what you do in comedy. And I, I love the fact that you make comedy something that's so much more accessible and so much more enjoyable, uh, especially in a time where people are, you know, they're a little bit nervous about doing it and about hearing it. So you're doing great Thank work in, in, in all your life, including your charity work. We appreciate you making the time for us. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for <laughs> with a sheepish like, thanks. <laughs> what do I, what do I, I can't follow that, that, eh? Can't Thank follow you. my thanks. I thanked every single <laughs> aspect of Will's life. I left yeah, you with good. nothing. Sorry, <laughs> Asif. So, Ali, that was your show for today. What did you think of the infamous, hilarious Dr. Glaucon Flecken? Part of me was wishing I had a podcast with him, you know, but I'm uh, – <laughs> whatever. It's you and me. We're trying to make this thing fly, and this – it's good. It's fine. No, that's not true at no, all. No, I really no. enjoy <laughs> – I, I loved having him on. Great perspective, and I can imagine he's a pretty – busy guy when you're at that level on the internet. Everybody wants a piece of you. So I'm really happy you made time for us. No, I, I, you know, I'd love to have him on again, maybe talk about some more ophthalmology stuff. Such an interesting career and he's doing so well for himself. And like I said, what he says really speaks to a lot of people, both in uh, his comedy and his advice about kind of being yourself on the internet, that message to physicians. So it was great. Before we go, Ali, anything to plug? Stand up. Ali.com. I almost forgot. I almost forgot my website. StandUpAli.com mm. is the website and the Twitter and the Instagram and the Facebook. Check it out. There's stuff. There's things. I was at Just for Laughs in July and those clips from the show I hosted are now online. Ha 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 dot com. If people are looking for some uh, entertainment. It's a great show. And as always, uh, you want to subscribe and follow us on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, reach out to us, drvcomedian at gmail.com. Uh, let us know what you think. Any ideas for new topics? What do you think of our interview today? Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. or amazing? Please let us know. <laughs> and please remember that although... Will and I are both doctors. We're not your doctors. Medical issues we talk about are for your interest and information only and are not medical advice. Please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.